you all for coming. As you know me, I'm the only instructor you got, so. Um, today's topic is uh, motivational interviewing, but we're gonna go a little bit in depth on how we get there. Uh, before we get started, we'll have everyone sound off that's here. Uh, Veronica's online, would you like to introduce yourself, Veronica? Tell us where you're at. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Veronica, and I'm a um, Perem um, student. And I'm attending part-time. So I just couldn't make it to the physical class today. That's okay. Thank you for coming. That's why we have this uh, online thing. So hopefully uh, it uh, does its job. Um, who's next? Uh, Leanne, you want to uh, introduce yourself? My name is Leanne Vincent. I'm welcome. And lastly, in front. Hi, my name is Amelia Kenner. Uh, I'm in Peru. And we have a guest. Uh, my daughter Ellie is here. Ellie Welcome, Ellie. Hopefully, you you get into college too uh, in the very near future. So we have yeah. lots of people to fill these seats. Okay, so um, I know we've talked. You can see me, but Catherine alone is coming. Oh, here. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for it. Welcome. We have more people than yeah. That's. You just increased our uh, attendance by 25%. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Um, so uh, I'm sure if you've been in my class, you've been exposed to motivation interview. However, I'm guessing it's still kind of a mystery um, because it's an enormous subject. And not only has... Sorry, there you, is that better? Yes, okay, uh, so let me repeat myself. Um, if you've been in my courses, you've been exposed to motivational interviewing, but it still might be a mystery to you um, on exactly what it is. And I'm going to break that down today. We got about an hour and 15 minutes. The first 45 minutes, well, uh, we'll spend on that and then maybe for some questions. And I'll do a, sh a short demonstration that I might have done in this class before. I do it a lot because I do training for the federal SAMHSA grant. And we do motivational interviewing for mental health and, uh, and medical providers. So motivational interviewing has gotten to the degree that it, it is so prolific in all areas of, of, of health and mental health providers that they want everyone trained in it. One of the reasons is um, it's used primarily with addictions uh, because it helps people resolve their internal ambivalence towards making a decision. But physical health is the same way. 66% of uh, folks in the hospital are there because of lifestyle choices, whether it's smoking, drinking, drugs, obesity. Uh, I, you know, if you've ever gone to the ER room, the other thing is um, uh, people who are like adrenaline junkies. <laughs> you know, like most of those people are there because they like busted something um, doing something. But I'm not trying to, trying to talk anybody out of that, but it's just kind of the fact is that a lot of the choices that we make lead to uh, the consequences of our, our lives. It couldn't be any other way. So what they notice is, <clears throat> especially in, with certain illnesses like smoking or obesity, diabetes, that even though patients were warned and given information about how to improve their condition, or just to, to be compliant with medication, they continued their pattern of behavior. Hello, welcome. Uh, and that pattern of behavior exacerbated or worsened their, uh, their symptoms, and ultimately uh, they had poor outcomes from it. When I, wore, when I went to a, an externship in Guatemala, uh, in Antigua, I met the medical director there. He was a physician from, um, Minnesota from, uh, what's that big, uh, not Carnegie, but, um, well, there's a, a big med school up there. I can't think of the name right now. Um, and he retired and then became the medical director of that facility down in Guatemala. And he told me, he's like, you know, Oscar, numbers speak to me. And we have a huge population with uh, diabetes and it's growing. And it's not because the food is not available or affordable. It's because the patients are choosing certain types of food that is making their diabetes worse. And these are type two diabetes. They could 
They can control it with diet and exercise, but that's not happening. And he says, what we know is that if the trend continues, it's going to bankrupt our, uh, it's a, it was a nonprofit an NGO that provided all kinds of social services to the community. It's, he said, that alone is gonna bankrupt us. So they started running training programs on nutrition programs at night, and they gave them incentives to come. And that helped to curb uh, the spread or the incidence of diabetes within the, the community that they serviced. And one of the precepts was how to convince people, or not really convince them, because that's not what we do. We give them an opportunity to kind of examine what they're doing. And this is what motivational interviewing does. Now, at the time, I was the beginning of my training, I hadn't heard of motivational interviewing. Um, but if I had, I definitely would have told him this is something that you know we should consider. Uh, let me kind of move on here. Um, so the point is, what MI does, essentially, is it helps somebody shine a light on their choices, examine why they make those choices, and then, through their own set of values, determine what's best for them, not us telling them the other way. This is why it's so useful in substance abuse counseling. So you'll say, um, you know, Bill, do you want to continue to drink or use drugs? Uh, and let's, let's think about it. Let's examine what are some of the pros and cons. And as they go through this list of pros and cons, they're going to come up on the side that they want to do. This isn't a cure-all. It isn't going to say, well, you're going to stop using drugs. But more likely than not, folks have a lot of more negative consequences from their drug use, but they don't tend to focus on them in the moment, right? Human beings have an enormous capacity for denial. Denial is a function of our mind that allows us to exist. Without it, we'd probably all become very depressed. I mean, we have to move on in the world in the face of terrible things happening and, and, and decide where we're gonna let our focus lie. But I wanna start off this exploration into motivational interviewing with a quote by Jung. This is from his uh, memoirs, Dreams, Reflections, and, and it's basically his, his self-authored, uh, his autobiography that he wrote in the spring of 1957. He was 81 years old, really didn't have much more in the way of trying to prove himself to people, but just to give him the honest truth of his own experience. Um, and here's the beginning of the quote. As far as we can discern, the purpose, the sole purpose of human ex existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. It may even be assumed that just as the unconscious affects us, so the increase in our conscious affects the unconscious. So as we learn more about our conscious self, we tend to learn more and inform our unconscious self, our dream world, our fantasy life, our internal world, our internal myths, so to say. But the point that, that really got me was the purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness. When we face clients whose lives are seemingly lost, we become a beacon to them. But we can't do that with judgment, with um, a negative attitude towards them. And this can be hard. How do we cultivate uh, what Carl Rogers, unconditional positive regard or compassion? When we are working with people whose values may differ very strongly from our own. And that's the first part of motivational interviewing is compassion. But I want to challenge you guys to think of that this is a not a one-time thing, a one-off. It's a lifetime commitment to the cultivation of compassion. And the first thing that we have to come to the understanding is that we are no different than our patients. We are not. A few degrees of separation, and we could be just where they're at, and the roles could be reversed. Or they may have been. You have made, they have gone from patient to counselor. And you might go back. <laughs> that happens too. Trust me. This is a symbol that I like to talk about because I think it personifies the human experience. And it's called the hubris. It's a serpent consuming its own tail. And it's the idea that life lives on life. 
you see this in economics, you see this in food production. Even vegetarians just eat things that can't run away from them. It doesn't make it any less destructive of an organism that is just as grand and, and valuable as any other organism. And until you can accept this ideal, you're going to be living in the fantasy land of childhood. That is to say, my shame to say it in the front alley here, but she is a child and she should have that innocence to preserve her as long as she could. But as counselors, we can't afford to have those kinds of attitudes. It's saying, well, we're gonna, I'm a nice person, I'm a good person, and because I care about the world, I wanna help, and that's gonna be enough for you. Well, what, what, what are you gonna do when you come up with a patient who has uh, multiple counts of strong arm robbery, violence, maybe multiple counts of rape, uh, child abuse, child neglect. You're gonna be able to suspend your goodness, your good nature that you think you are and work with this person? No, you're gonna, you, you might pass judgment on them. You might have a negative attitude towards them. You see this all the time. Uh, Amelia and I were talking about the court system and you see this with police. They, oh, we are the moral right. But everyone knows deep down nobody's all one thing. We're both black and white. These dual powers. The only thing that we can do is lean towards the light. But don't mistake that for you being correct or knowing anything. And sometimes the moral right is the wrong thing to do. And the moral corrupt or the evil act is the right thing to do because the moral order is in flux, it's changing. And we're seeing that all the time. But you won't know when to do that if you just look, read out of your book. You have to think from your gut. You have to go from experience. Context plays a big value in there. Um, otherwise, you're gonna make big, big mistakes with your clients. And I'm trying to warn you that now, and I think it's hard to describe these things, but I'm doing the best that I can because um, it's so important. And I think having this foundational understanding of life first is the easiest way to get to, I can be compassionate towards other people because I don't see myself as above or better than them, even though I'm in a different position than them. So the basis of motivation or interviewing comes from Carl Rogers work um, on uh, person-centered therapy or client-centered therapy. Um, and this was always one that was challenging for uh, graduate students to, to grasp. They, we, would, we would practice the, the theoretical concepts and interventions, and they would always stumble and say, you know, I, it's just too nebulous. It doesn't have any uh, concrete uh, skills. And well, Bill Miller comes along 20 years later, or overlapping really, Carl Rogers' own life, and, and develops motivational interviewing, where he basically formalizes a Carl Rogers' uh, work into very concrete set of skills and attitudes that you can take to your, your client. And we'll get into that right now. So MI is goal-directed, client-centered, and its intent is to elicit behavioral change by helping them explore their ambivalence. This is a direct quote from Miller's work. Um, that's me, I got to meet him one time, great man in his 80s. Uh, I was traveling with a friend of mine over summer break and she said, guess what, I emailed Bill Miller, because we're big MI people, <laughs> and he agreed to meet us for coffee, him and his wife. And he sat with me for an afternoon, two hours of his time, this great researcher and um, charming man and lovely wife, and just, um, just gave us, you know, uh, of everything. And we, we talked about how much we admired him and he was like, yeah, you need to go to life. <laughs> he was very humble, but I said, listen, I gotta say it, you know, because you've transformed the industry. Because I came in when MI wasn't a big deal and now it is, and it's, it's made a dramatic shift. The other important thing to remember, this is a, this graphic here is uh, the stages of change mo model by uh, Petroska D. Clemente, and you've probably seen it in some of my courses. 
a lot of these things you might say, well, you know, you're repeating this stuff. And I hear that in discussion posts. I'm not repeating it. I'm exposing to you again. I know what I did and it's intentional. And luckily I get to, I got to build this program from the ground up and the bachelor's program from the ground up too. So what I've done is put the most important things so you remember them after you graduate. Because trust me, you're going to forget a lot of what you learned. <laughs> That's just part of the way human beings are. We, so I'm, I'm trying to really impress upon you the most important things. And one of the things to remember when we're um, applying uh, interventions to clients is to meet them where they're at. What level of motivation are they at? Are they at the maintenance, action, preparation, contemplation, pre-contemplation? And I'll review those really quickly. Pre-contemplation is I'm not thinking about changing at all. I'm not thinking about changing my behavior. I'm not contemplating. Contemplation, I'm thinking, maybe I should slow down on my drinking or drug use. I'm thinking about it. Preparation, I'm taking steps to make changes. I'm going to see a treatment provider. I'm uh, coming up with alternatives to um, how I manage and cope with my stress and anxiety. Action, I'm in it. I'm actively abstinent or reducing in my use. And then maintenance is the continuation of that. And then we've got that arrow, that big black arrow going back to the beginning, relapse. It is very common and you should expect it, but you shouldn't hope for it. Um, and you shouldn't be disappointed by your clients because this is a difficult thing to do. Um, and being addicted to these very powerful drugs and behaviors um, is not, and there's no simple task. Otherwise they wouldn't need professionals uh, to, to help them through it. So remember to pair your level of change, or excuse me, with your intervention strategy with the level of change that they're at. So pre-contemplation would look something like just maybe some information. Are you aware of what drugs and alcohol can do to you and how it hurts you? Um, this is something you think about. Here are some options available for you if you'd like to change. Um, contemplation, identifying some barriers, misconceptions, um, address concerns of system support, that's friends, family, or in behavior, even having to be in a treatment facility. Uh, preparation, developing realistic goals for, for change. So you, this is where your treatment planning comes in, which most of you have been exposed to all this stuff. And then uh, during the action stage of change, when they're doing it, you're gonna provide positive reinforcement, more of a coach in that time. And then uh, encouraging their continued uh, success and support. Okay. So for relapse, would you be prepared for relapse prior to clients? Yeah, relapse prevention. Like you would, you would want to warn them. A lot of people don't talk about it. They just blame or judge the client. Like, oh, Bill, you know, he had a relapse. Instead of saying, you know, let's talk about what happened. Let's learn from this mistake. You know, I heard a quote. That, um, I'm not a biz big business guy, but they said that most successful entrepreneurs and millionaires have filed bankruptcy on an average of three times. That shocked most of us, right? Because they learn from their mistakes and they try again. And so even though they fail, they, they, they dust themselves off, pick themselves up, and they try again. And that's something I would share with my clients in group. Like, hey, just because you fail doesn't mean you're going to fail forever. It's part of the process to fall down. And if you think if you're lucky enough to go straight through, you know, that's uh, that's that's uncommon, but hopeful. So we want to look at as ambivalence is not um, resistance. They'll say, well, they haven't hit rock bottom yet. They haven't. Just, that's not necessary. A lot of times it does happen, but it's not necessary. Um, using direct persuasion or punishment. And, and, and punishment can come in different ways, right? Keeping somebody out of a program, judging them, using a harsh tone with them or a look like disappointment. And that's where you've got to stow your own feelings because that's not part of them. That's part of you. And maybe you see the addict in them that you were and you wish that wasn't so. And instead of you living, you know, resolving those feelings inside you, you project them onto your client and get angry with them. And I've seen this, and it's very irresponsible as a counsel. That doesn't mean you don't have those feelings. It doesn't mean you don't process them with a colleague or a supervisor, but you don't lay your stuff on the client. That's unfair and unhelpful. 
and they might not come back to treatment. And I tell you, I've heard lots of horror stories um, about people's interjecting their own values in the in, in these counseling sessions, which really turn the client off, makes them feel unwanted, uncared for, um, judged, and ridiculed. And just to give you an example of what that um, might look like, is a, a friend of mine was telling me, a colleague, that she uh, had um, gone to a counselor and she was having severe depression and she was you know, coming up with two options for herself. Either I go back on medication or I take FMLA and take a certain amount of time off so I can get my depression under control. The counselor replied, well, if you want to um, end your career, go ahead and do that. Now, how do you think that made the client feel? Like, this person doesn't care that I'm ready to jump out a window. They're worried about my career, which I'm not. Why are they? It's my career. Um, because depression can be a very powerful um, mental disorder that can disrupt all areas of your life. <clears throat> okay. The spirit of MI is collaborative. That means the goal should be come up with, excuse me, they should be explored with the client. It's evocative in the sense that it asks the client to uncover the underlying emotions that either motivate them or move them away from positive change. And here's a secret. When you're working with clients, until you've reached the bedrock of certain emotions, you're never going to find that motivation. But it doesn't come just saying, hey, what motivates you towards change? You've got to develop rapport, relationship. You have to express empathy and non-judgment attitude, positive concern for your client. This is like um, being a warm fire. You come in, the client comes in out of the cold, and in front of them is, is the counselor. And I'm going to represent the counselor as a, a warm fire. And in that, and they, they sit there for a little while and they get warm. They take off their jacket, they take off their snowshoes, they take off their scarf and their gloves and their hat, and they're exposed to you, they're open to you. And of course, when they go back out into the world, they're going to put all that stuff back on. They can't just go around naked because it's a little bit too raw. But that's the attitude I want you to take when you're with your clients and ask yourself, am I a warm fire? Or am I a fire that's sufficient? Because you don't want to be a blazing fire and overwhelm them. You want to be a fire that provides warmth, comfort, uh, a feeling of safety. I don't know if you ever come in out of the cold. You, you definitely feel a lot safer when you're inside, right? Autonomy, the right to self-determination and independence and freedom. That, that we respect that. That example that I gave earlier, where if the client was not being respected and their own self-determination was being challenged, as if they were making a poor life decision because their concern about their mental health uh, superseded their career aspirations. And then the MI spirit must be authentic. If you are not feeling your clients or have a negative attitude towards them, and you're trying to fake it, that authenticity is not gonna come through or they're gonna feel that. Um, and so these ideals should be in align with your own personal ideas. If you have a problem with that, it's, it's worth it to explore them. So what does it mean to be authentic? Real? Yeah. Yeah. So to some degree, yeah, we have to be transparent with our feelings. We shouldn't try to hide them because we're human beings. But a lot of times you'll see this attitude of the counselor, the consummate counselor or professor. I'm just almost like a, a priest. I'm, you know, I have no problems in my life. I, beyond human experience and judgment, I'm almost, you know, like a sage. Well, that's, that doesn't come across as very real, especially for real people. Like, I mean, some real people who've just been, you know, just out of prison. There was no pretenses there. These people. So you need to engage them in a, in a way that, they're, they're able to perceive your humanness instead of this veneer of a professional. Drop that act. 
that's for your boss and your coworkers, but for clients, we need to be more authentic. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to read it um, so we can. I believe that the core of being an authentic human being is in your healthy self-esteem. That if you don't have these, uh, and healthy self-esteem isn't just being a narcissist saying I'm the greatest person in the world, everybody loves me, and I'm, you know, a master of my own destiny. It's having an authentic life, and I'm going to go through these six pillars here. Number one is, and I know I'm going to be off screen here, is self-acceptance. Do you accept yourself, take responsibility for your thoughts, feelings, and actions without denying them or disowning them? Self-responsibility, realizing that we are, we, the choices that we make um, uh, inform our life and either allow us to attain our goals or not. You know, a lot of people say, I want to be this, I don't want to be that. And I, want, I saw this meme on, or this little video that Will Smith did. He said, everybody says, I want to be a movie, they yell out to I want to be a movie star, I want to be famous. He's like, but most people lack the self-discipline to, to make choices every their everyday lives that are going to lead them towards their own success. It's one thing to want something. It's another thing to actually work for it. It, it takes a lot of effort and work to be there and to, be, uh, to make a sizable uh, level of success. Self-assertiveness, being authentic in our dealings with others. Do we treat others with respect? Um, do we espouse our own values instead of just going along with the crap? You know, in the face of our boss telling us to do something unethical, do we cave or do we say, no, I, this is where I hold the line here because money's money and my self-worth is, is something I can't put a price on. And living purposely, identifying our short-term and long-term goals, um, putting those into action, uh, revising them when things don't go the way we plan them, and lastly, and the most important is personal integrity. You know, do I, do I live with congruence, with honesty? Uh, do I exemplify my actions in my personal and professional life? Are they uh, congruent? Are they uh, at odds with each other? Do I pretend to be one thing in my professional life and something completely different in my personal life? You know, uh, Without integrity, we lack any kind of real strength and no weight can be put on us. We're just, we're just a tissue paper, so to say. We don't, can't hold anything up. But if we have integrity, and if you've ever seen um, like superstructures, they have all these, these pillars going in the same direction, holding up things. And these six pillars of self-esteem are those pillars where one fails, the whole, the whole structure fails. And that doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but you have to be at least aspiring to some of these ideals. And without this kind of um, continuity in your life, you lack confidence. And a counselor with no confidence is not gonna help anybody change. Um, this is why it's so important that you know the material that you study in course. You don't, because when you don't, you step into the counseling, uh, the group room or with your client, and you go, I don't know what to do. I forgot, I didn't study, I just kind of skated by with a C minus and now I graduated, and guess what? I have to start all over again. Well, you just spent $6,000 getting an education that isn't worth much because you didn't pay attention, or you didn't study, or you cheated on your exams, which people do. I'm not the moral police. I'm here to provide you with an opportunity for growth and change and professional development. Whether you choose to take that or not is not up to me. My colleagues will say, oh, well, yeah, Oscar, you should have exams at a proctor. I don't really have time for that. If you don't want to take this seriously, that's not my job. If you don't want to take your life seriously, that's not my problem either. I, I'm like a source of like the lights. You want to take it or leave it, it's, it's here for you, but whether you decide to absorb it or not is not really up to me. I do try to inspire and cultivate uh, an attitude of caring, concern, compassion for my students and for, and for their patients in return, but I'm not going to be a sucker. And I can't tell you how many excuses I hear every day all day. And I have 179 students that I advise, so you, you can imagine. The same ones tend to come to me over and over with some problem. It's like, wow, you're always at, you know, and I know life circumstances does take a change, and sometimes we just have to change our goals, you know. <clears throat> okay, so just to recap that, without uh, conscientious living or critical awareness of ourselves, we lack confidence as counselors. Without self-acceptance, 
um, we're in tension with ourselves. We don't like ourselves. We're not gentle and kind and loving towards ourselves. With, uh, and we don't have the confidence of feeling assertive. Without integrity, we don't have self-respect. And without purpose, we lack direction. And if all these other ideals are not in accord, we lack integrity. This is the first part of being a good counselor, is, is being in accord with, being, harmonizing your life. Does that make sense? So there isn't one, yeah, balance. And that doesn't mean busting uh, your butt to, to, to work in the treatment center all day, every day. You're like, I'm just gonna save the world, you know, single-handedly, I can bear the weight. You're gonna crumble under that weight, and you're also not gonna have a personal life or meaningful uh, experiences outside of work, and then you're just gonna de develop some other kind of addiction towards work. You know, like people call it workaholic or something like that. People are like, hey, you know, I say no to a lot of things. <laughs> and I see some of my peers, they're, they're just working, they don't have a personal life, they don't take time for relaxation, reflection, uh, self-care, and they suffer as a result. So please cultivate that in your life. One of my big complaints with the academic programs is that we stress the student to such a degree they don't have a personal life. And then they go through for uh, an associate's and a bachelor's and a master's or a PhD. By the time they get there, they're 45 years old and they don't know how to live. They don't even know how to manage their own household, but they got a PhD or, or personal relationships. <clears throat> okay, so principles of MI are expressing empathy. We talked about that quite a bit. Um, Self-discrepancy rolling with resistance, and supporting self-efficacy. And I'll go into those right in a, in a second. I just want to talk about this, uh, just kind of outline them. <clears throat> Empathy, um, these are listening skills. Sounds easy, just listen, no, it's no problem. Carl Rogers, who spent his whole life developing the theories that support MI, tells you that's the hardest thing he's ever learned how, had to learn how to do, and it didn't get any easier. Just like a professional athlete, you always have to be mindful and practice and, and be attentive. You're suspending your own thoughts and beliefs when listening. You allow yourself to feel what others are feeling, which can be very difficult, especially if they're expressing profound pain, loss, grief, sadness. The first thing you want to do is just get them to shut up. Okay, stop, 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 stop. You know, when, when children cry, when they scrape their knee, the first thing we do is shh, it's okay, shh. It's okay, you're gonna be okay. Basically asking them to disown their feelings, to ignore them, and then we, they grow up to be adults, they don't know why they have no connectivity to their own emotional experience and can't relate to others. It's, very, it's, 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 it's a sad thing, but growing up as a male in this society, I remember being five years old, falling off my tricycle thinking I'm and being laughed at. I'm thinking I'm never gonna cry in front of anybody again. It probably took me 25 years before that did happen. Um, and then also um, learning that just by empathizing is not agreeing to understand. Somebody's got their mic on if you mute it. Um, and to feel what, uh, that somehow that if you empathize with this person, they're going to change the way you feel about your own values. Whoever's clicking, please mute your... I got it. Okay, uh, we're gonna skip over that, we don't have time for that. Uh, it takes a long time to talk about house. <laughs> um, so getting to back to the first precept, identifying discrepancy, pointing out, or second, pointing out obvious contradictions. So Bill, it sounds like you're telling me that, um, this is not judgmental, you know, just, you wanna stop drinking, but every weekend it seems to be like after our session, you're, you, you feel motivated, you tell me you're gonna get your drinking and drug use under control, but then, Tuesday comes around, I meet you and I ask you to report your use and it's always about the same level. So I hear you on one, one side telling me, I don't want to do this anymore. But then on, there's another side that's telling me, absolutely, you want to keep doing this. Help me understand what that looks like. So this is not a judgment, just pointing out these things in a non-threatening way. Let's just compare them, you know. Rolling with resistance. Recognizing that the danger of arguing the point in many cases entrenches somebody in their beliefs. If I tell you, you need to stop doing this, you need to change, you need to get a handle on your, your behavior, that doesn't change anybody. It pisses them off. It makes them feel like you're their enemy now. 
So don't participate in the conflict. One of the best analogies that I like to use, one of my interns um, said, is let go of the rope. So imagine that you're in a tug of war with your client and you're pulling this way towards abstinence and they're pulling that way towards you know party lifestyle. <laughs> but let go of the rope, let go of the tension. And then when they fall into it, they'll dust themselves off and say, okay, I think I've had enough of that. But you're not gonna do it by changing people. We lock people up in prison for 25 years and they come out and start using it on the street again when they got in trouble for it in the first, first place. That doesn't work. And then reinforcing their autonomy which creates optimism. I know that you feel like you don't want to be here right now and you have the choice to leave. So like, this happens all the time when people are in rehab facilities, 30, 60, 90 days, they want to leave. They're like, I got to get out of here. I'm done with this. You guys don't care. They're pointing out everything that's wrong because they want to get out of there and go use. You let that go. Okay, this is not a jail cell. You might end up, up, up in one if you go back out there and use, but that's not my choice. You have a choice. This one today offers you freedom in the future. That one is just a chain around your neck that you've been living with for 10 years. So just being really honest about that, but also recognizing they have that freedom of choice because when you take that away, people want to immediately go to the other side. You see this all the time um, in, any, in, in any kinds of decisions. When you, don't, when you feel like you don't have a choice, you want to go the other way. Supporting self-efficacy. And that is the belief that there's something you can do in this situation that can make you feel better or direct your own behavior towards change. And the self-efficacy is just a belief. But guess what? Beliefs drive everything that we do. So if you can elicit the times your patient has been uh, efficacious on their own without intervention, I mean, did anybody tell you to do this? No. Why did you do it? I don't know, I've always been able to do it. Something I, I, ha I pride myself on, something like that. Then you can develop that and then generalize that towards their goals, towards um, their treatment plan. Any questions about that? Is that, is that clear? Okay. So breaking down self-efficacy to a finer point, um, they've developed this is a five factor that I got from uh, uh, Brene Brown's research. And there's a book that she writes about called The Gift of Imperfection. Um, she kind of touts herself as a perfectionist and then recognizes how its own downfall. So folks with resilience are resourceful. Um, they look for resources to solve problems. They're more likely to seek help. How many of us stubborn SOBs don't want to look for help. Ask somebody, right? And this is common, right? I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't need anything. I got, got this. And then, you know, of course, you got your drug of choice really holding you back. And then having the belief that something that they can do can help manage their feelings, even if it's taking a deep breath, even if it's taking a walk around the block. Teach your clients something that they can use. Um, having social support. If you got nobody, you're on your own. If you got others, well, they're a pain in the ass, but at least you was, you got somebody, right? Uh, and then um, making sure they're connected to family, friends, um, people that are important in their life. When we see clients at their worst, and we see them at their worst because they come in for treatment when they're really needing our help, they lack a lot of these things, and we want to rebuild that. And in rebuilding that, their self-efficacy, influences your self-esteem. And then nurturing spirituality. You've probably seen this a lot of in AA, and any treatment program should have some aspect of exploration into the spiritual life. Those hard-headed folks that think that this, there's nothing in this world except for rational thought and experience and cause-effect relationships, those are the ones in big trouble because they have lost connection with a sense of awe and inspiration in the of the universe, a sense of awe and inspiration of a religious icon or symbol, or their own experience of, you know, like laughter of a child or a newborn baby. You know, if you don't see the greatness and the magnitude in a newborn child, it, nothing's going to shake you. Um, So, when
when we're kind of gauging where people are on that continuum of change, we, we can use these skills to enhance their motivation. So the assessment, which I mean, as a counselor, I hate doing, but a lot of times you'll, you'll see people's wheels start to turn when you're asking these questions, like how long have you been using? Oh, since I was 14. How often do you use? Oh, about six days a week. You know, what's the last time you used? What dosage do you do? You know, all of a sudden they're like, God, I do have a drug problem, you know, uh, because that assessment just vets things out. It gets pretty clear. Um, Okay, so summarizing MI, uh, motivation to change is elicited from the client, not imposed from outside forces. So we're asking them what motivates you? What are some of the most important reasons you want to change in this, you know, in terms of this behavior? Uh, it's not the client's, it's not the client's task, excuse me, it's the client's task, not the counselor's task, to articulate and resolve his or her own ambivalence. Don't try to talk them into it. That's like trying to talk somebody into sleeping with you. If they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. Now you're just nagging them, you know? Um, so this should be something we both want, not just one party, right? Dep direct persuasion is not effective method for resolving ambivalence. So just forcing them does not, does not change them. They might in the moment pretend, but in reality, it doesn't really. So the, uh, Leanne really liked that comment about it. <laughs> um, you'll never forget it, I'll tell you that, right? Um, the counselor is directive in that they help the client examine their behavior and their ambivalence, but not in terms of goals and outcomes. Like, you're gonna do this now. Um, recognizing that readiness of change, excuse me, the state of change that they're in may fluctuate. Some days they might be really motivated. Think about yourself going to the gym. You're like, some days I'm like, eh, hey. and other days I'm like, there's no way that's happening, you know? Um, Have you heard the pink cloud reference? No. It's, it's a lot in the treatment facility. The pink cloud, like when you first start the process of change, you're like really excited, and then like reality hits because you have to actually do it. Yeah. Um, that kind of reminds me. Yeah, and, and, and there's a there's kind of a disillusion, there's an illusion that you can just do this, and that's going to be easy. Right. Yeah, that's like, right. I mean, I got this, but then the reality is that I've done a lot of things, terrible things in my addiction, and that has a lot of weight to it, of guilt and shame that I have to process and make some kind of you know, uh, to resolve that somehow, either make amends within, with the relationships or myself and just, you know, try to come up with new goals and new life aspirations to ameliorate that. Um, and then, so remembering that the therapeutic relationship is like a partnership. You're not the authority, you're, you're not the master or the expert in their own lives. The patients are the experts in their own lives. Okay, so, Skills, uh, this is one way it, uh, counseling styles do not work. That is trying to just tell people what to do. Telling the client the reasons change. Tell them about the importance of change. And then telling them about how to go about changing. That's the opposite of MI. In MI, we ask the client why they want to make this change. Ask them what are their three best reasons to change. This is one way of doing it. Uh, asking the importance of how important uh, it is for them to change. I'm like using a, 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 some kind of value system, like scale 1, 10, 10 being absolutely you want to change, 1, not at all. Where are you at? Help me understand that. Just exploring, just engaging them. And then ask, how, would you, how do you think you might do this? Like, what are some ideas that you have? They thought about this a lot. Now, do you see the subtlety and the difference? I'm just asking instead of telling. Big difference. You also want to ask them for permission to talk about this. They might not want to talk about it at that point, point in time. Okay, so we got through basically some of the concepts and precepts. We don't have time to go into skills today. Um, we might do that um, at a later date or through um, video lecture. But I wanted to spend a few minutes to, um, in the final analysis to give the master a few words about this. There's a, a video, three minutes, that I want to watch, and it's just uh, Carl Rogers talking about uh, what he does, and maybe that'll kind of make a deeper impression.
You've heard much in this conference about the skill of empathic listening. I simply want to underscore what has been this um, I Can you guys, the other sites, mute themselves, otherwise an echo effect going. Elko, mute your mic if it's not already muted. Okay. You've heard much in this conference about the skill of empathic I, I need the other sites to mute themselves, uh, Elko and Winnemucca, because there's an echo that's coming through. No, no, not there. Nope, nope. The, the little thing on the desk, the little mics. There's got to be some, otherwise we wouldn't be able to hear you. I know, I can hear you, you can hear me, but they're usually sitting on the table. Yeah. Go up to the dais. Usually there's one there for the professor, so. Okay, okay the other thing you can do is just go back to the remote and um, turn the volume down as low as you can go. In that little round button, or there's a like a little round, just just volume on the left hand side of it, just volume down all the way. You should see the volume way down. Okay. All right, we're gonna give it a shot. You've heard much in this conference about the skill of empathic listening. I simply want to underscore what has been said because I believe it plays a large part in our future. I have come to believe that a very sensitive listening is one of the most powerful forces for growth that I know. When I can let myself enter, softly and delicately, the vulnerable inner world of the other person, when I can temporarily lay aside my views and values and prejudices, when I can let myself be at home in the fright, the concern, the pain, the anger, the tenderness, the confusion which fills his or her life, when I can move about in that inner world without making judgments, when I can see that world with fresh, unfrightened eyes, when I can check the accuracy of my sensings with him or her, being guided by the responses I receive, then I can be a companion to that inner person, pointing to the felt meanings of what is being experienced. Then I find myself to be a true helper, a welcome companion, an aid to growth and health. Listening seems such an easy word. I find it a lifetime task to achieve true listening and a task well worth the effort. There's another very subtle factor in the healing relationship which I have experienced and that I would call presence. 
It's certainly known to physicians. Dr. William Henry Welch, speaking of his father, said the art of healing seemed to surround his physical body like an aura. It was often not his treatment, but his presence that cured. I, too, have experienced this. When I'm at my best as a group facilitator or a therapist, I discover this characteristic. I find that when I am closest to my inner intuitive self, when I'm somehow in touch with the unknown in me, when perhaps I'm in a slightly altered state of consciousness, then whatever I do. Okay, we're gonna, I'm just gonna, folks, can I get your attention? I can hear you guys, so this is even worse than it would have been. Um, am I on mute? Yeah. Yeah, they can't hear me now. Okay. Um, I can't get their attention because they, they turned on the volume. Let me go back to the PowerPoint and that'll do it. Okay. So here's the problem when you guys were talking, you were we could still hear you. Oh. Yeah. So okay. I, I see all these little guys up here. I don't know. Those are the mics, and I don't know how to turn Yeah, them. okay. I don't either. So it's okay. Um, so what I'll do is I'll send that video out so you guys can review it. It's, a, it's really worth the effort, uh, the three minutes. It really exemplifies and personifies what presence and listening can do for your client. And ultimately, it's the most important healing factor. Okay? I can't impress that enough to you guys. Um, So with that, um, we can uh, conclude the little short lecture that I had ready for you guys today. I want to give enough time because last time we were, I was trying to ask questions or there was leaving time for questions, but people just cut off the, the, the call, cut off in the middle of it. So I want to stop with ample time. If there's anybody that has any questions about some of the lecture material, I want to keep it focused on the lecture material, not got something else to ask me about class or something else, you can email me for that. What is resist the writing reflex? Yeah, so if um, you start telling me about a problem you have, mm -hmm. and my mind is, well, you shouldn't do that. And then the first thing I want to tell you to do is, this is how you should solve your problem, right? So now I'm not listening to you any longer. I'm actually telling you how to go about solving your problem. You feel, even though it's well-meaning, maybe, it feels um, impersonal, it feels judgmental. So um, a common uh, idea in MI is to resist trying to correct things. Let them play it out. They'll get to the end of it and say, you know what, but I should have done this. But if you don't let them get there, you don't let enough of that exploration to happen, then a lot of times you disrupt that process. So, um, and if they're telling you what they did wrong, they're obviously open, open to you because this is not something easy to, to discuss. That's a good question. Anybody else? Um, okay, I'll ask another question. So when, I, when I've had um, instances with a client where we'll go over you know, the good and bad, and they almost, like, they really enjoy deviant behavior. Yeah. Like, they almost are addicted to the deviant behavior. Right, doing like the wrong thing. underground scene and the fast life. Um, Not being a square. Right, or, yeah, the, on the other side. Yeah. Um, well, how would I use this? Would I just see, well, like, the whole drug court thing? Or, like, how would you use that when you know that they're... Maybe not ready. I don't know. Well, they might have not have matured to the point where they can recognize that this is really bad for them. Yeah. And just a reflection in that case, it sounds like it really excites you to just break the law. 
like doing things, being part of the subculture, and just I'm expressing it just the way they're telling me. Now it sounds like I'm agreeing with it. I'm not. Right. I'm using a reflection of empathy, emotion, content, and the meaning of their experience. And they'll say, "Yeah, but you know what? I am I'm 38 years old, and I got nothing to show for it." So there's a part of us that that wants to kind of they call it euphoric recall, where you're like, yeah, oh my God, we did so much coke or whatever. It was amazing. We had such an incredible time. Let them keep going or reflect them. It sounds like, wow, it sounds like you really enjoy, you know, partying and that lifestyle and being around those folks. And they're like, well, but you don't have any money. They'll come to the other side of it if you reflect it. So while it seems like, like, that's the other idea because you're almost saying, I want to correct this vision because it's skewed. Right. Now, you might be able to do that and be effective at it, right. but that's not part of MI. Right. And there might be a time where you say, I mean, but seriously, why are you even here then? If this world is so great, that's developing discrepancy. Right. You could do that too. Um, I think it's the kinds of things that we do in MI these are the basic concepts and you have to learn to play with them like an artist or a dancer. You know, you don't, you can't just fall on one side or the other. You just kind of have to know when to maybe use that, that, that step, so to say. Any other questions? You have me here. Professor, I have a question. So when you're using the MI method, do you try to use other methods in, com in combination in order to help the client? Yeah, that's a good question. So you're saying, are we gonna use more than just one method for working with our clients? Absolutely. Because different problems and different aspects of those same problem have different applications of intervention that you can use. One is skills training. One is values development. You know, one is exploration of the self. You know, these are all different types of things. One is emotional processing, emotional regulation. Those lie outside of MI. MI is just for what we talked about it, resolving the ambivalence. But you're going to constantly be going in and out of that. You're going to be using it the whole time. It's like a foundation. It's an attitude towards a person. Um, but on top of that, there's, you know, in grad school, they'd always tell us, you need to pick one theory and just live with that one. You know, that doesn't work. That's not real life. You know, it's very common for, in, in academia to say, we have the answer. Here it is. All you have to do is go out and make it happen. And guess what? They'll lead you astray because they're not honest. If we don't have all the answers, we're doing our best effort and we're trying to ex examine these things, but they might change. Um, and anybody who's worked their salt as a counselor or a professor would tell you the truth in that. The ones that want to be there for their own convictions, their own pride, their own, uh, you know, admiration of themselves will tell you anything to make themselves feel like superior. I see it all the time. And it's a big disservice to you as, as students because you can't really believe it, right? You're like, yeah, that doesn't seem like that's gonna work in the real world. And second, to because to, you take that attitude to your clients and then it gives them <clears throat> that feeling too. Thank you for that question. Does that, was that, did that explicate, uh, shine a little light yeah. on what you were asking? Yes, I did. And what else? Um, All right, well, if there's no other questions, we can go ahead and uh, break the session. Please send me an email if you came today, uh, just telling me that you came and I'll be sure to add that extra credit. I haven't added the extra credit from the last symposium yet. I do that at the end of the semester just because when I calculate the grades, I have to separate it out. So. I have I have the previous list of folks who came. Um, all right, guys. Thanks for your time and attention today, and I'll see you back in the online classroom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.